I want to first thank the organizers of this uh, symposium. This has been an incredible experience for me thus far. And I want to apologize in advance if I keep trying to leave. It's only because uh, by nature when I teach, I pace, and I've been chained to this thing. So we're going to see how that works. I might accidentally drag the pulpit with me. Forgive me if I do. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, the, the tech gentleman in the back who pulled a rabbit out of his hat and managed to get my Mac presentation working right up on the screen. And he even dimmed the lights so it'll be a little easier for you to sleep. Um, so yeah, appreciate that. On that topic, I, uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Stephen Smoot for that presentation. That was really incredible. And I'm very impressed with what's being done at Book of Mormon Central because it does strike a real need. I'm looking at this audience right here and looking for all the millennials. And honestly, I, I can't say good evening, brothers and sisters. It's, it's really good evening, grandmas and grandpas. Um, we, we've got to, we've got to do more. And I'm so thankful for the group and the work that they're doing. Um, and with that, I will follow the good example and start my timer because I was threatened within an inch of my life, and we will get started. Um, the Book of Mormon as an Ascension text is my topic tonight, and I wanted to give a quick note before I get too far into it about the references that I'll be using. I know that a lot of people have uh, followed the good practice of giving the LDS reference, the RLDS reference. Um, in mine, I, I won't actually give any references at all because... <laughs> I have not only the burden of, of RLDS and LDS and two numberings, but I actually use a version of the Book of Mormon currently uh, that uses another numbering system. Um, this edition here, it's very recent. It's called the New Covenants Edition, um, and it is based on an effort that's gone on for the last several years to recover the Book of Mormon text as correctly as possible, relying on the work of Royal Skousen and others, the printer's manuscript, all of the early, well, what's left of the original manuscript, and then the editorial changes that can be confirmed as coming from Joseph Smith. That was all put together, and then interestingly was bound in one volume with the New Testament, as Joseph Smith is documented as saying his goal was to do. So that's what the New Covenants edition is. It has the New Testament and that version of the Book of Mormon. And rather than giving you three references for every scripture, you know, the electronic search stuff is so good you'll know where to find the scripture in your particular favorite version. So we all recognize these words. So with that, <clears throat> let's talk about an ascension text. And there's four things we're going to discuss tonight. First, uh, examples of personal ascension in the Book of Mormon. Second, looks like I'm going to have to hold this really particularly to get the signal through. Second, we want to talk about journeys in the Book of Mormon as symbols of ascension. Third, the temple as ascension, as an ascension symbol. And then finally, why all of this matters to us. So there's the roadmap for where we're going. <clears throat> and we'll define ascension in my presentation tonight as moving to a state of increased holiness, making the journey that terminates an encounter with the divine, starting with where you are or what you are and moving to become something holier, something better, something greater. Is that not the purpose of the religion that we embrace? And is that not the purpose why Jesus Christ came and did what he did and sacrificed his life for us so that he could help us ascend. Now, <clears throat> I want to address for a moment the theme of the conference, which is salvation in Christ. Um, we have this notion of salvation, and we have to ask ourselves, what is salvation, particularly as it's outlined in the Book of Mormon? Because there are many different definitions Somebody mentioned earlier, so have you been saved? How many times do we hear that from our other Christian cousins and evangelicals? Oh, have you been saved? Did you get saved? Oh, you're not. We can take care of that in 30 seconds. Say this prayer, and now you're saved. And I, I served as a missionary in North Carolina. I encountered that idea a lot, and I'm not critical of it because I understand what they were saying. What they meant was, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
then you become part of what he will save. And so is salvation just an event that happens right this minute? Is it a path that we follow throughout our life? Is it an outcome that we hope to achieve at the end of our life? These are all questions, and there's probably a lot of different definitions. And then we have to say saved from what? What do we mean when we say saved? Hey, left-handed will work. I like Jacob's summary, where he says, Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Yea, that monster death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. Well, there's a good definition of what we need to be saved from. We have death that we're all going to face, and we have something called hell, which, again, we could start talking about definitions for that. Well, let's talk about what Alma said. Now, concerning the state of the soul between death and the resurrection, behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, and pardon my voice, uh, I'm just getting over something in my throat. I'm going to squeak and cough. And if you'll bear with me, I'll keep trying. (laughs) The spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. He then goes on to talk about the spirits of the righteous are received into a state of happiness called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they shall rest from all their troubles and from all their care and sorrow. And then he talks about the spirits of the wicked received into a a, a condition he calls outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But he says that's a temporary because you stay there until the resurrection from the dead. So this notion of heaven and hell, going to a good place, going to a bad place, according to the Book of Mormon, there's something after. There's a resurrection, and then what happens? What's after the resurrection? And if you're going to heaven, what heaven are you talking about? Is there just kind of this general concept of happiness called heaven? Do we look at the three degrees of glory that Joseph Smith taught about? Celestial, terrestrial, celestial glory. Do we talk about seven levels of heaven? Joseph said, Paul spoke about going to the third level of heaven. He says, I knew a man who went to the seventh level of heaven. So what do we mean when we say heaven? It's clear that there are a lot of nuances and a lot of questions when we talk about salvation. In the end, though the term's mentioned many many times, there's never an explicit definition given for salvation and what that means in its entirety. But there is a related term with a concrete definition in the Book of Mormon I'm going to focus on, and that is redemption. Now, I'm going to, first of all, start with the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. I like to use that dictionary. Do many of you use that? Yeah, you can look it up online. It's super easy. And that is the dictionary that was current usage and state-of-the-art when the Book of Mormon was published, which means when God gave the translation to Joseph Smith— the then current English is captured in this dictionary. So I like to go there for some of the more obscure terms and even for terms that I think I know because we all use a lot of the words that are in the Book of Mormon, but we don't realize how they may have changed over time. And if you don't think um, words change very quickly, let me just tell you how gay I feel. (laughs) Case in point. All right. So redemption in 1828 to purchase back, to ransom, to liberate, or rescue from captivity or bondage, or from any obligation or liability to suffer or to be forfeited by paying an equivalent, as to redeem prisoners or captured goods, to redeem a pledge, to repurchase what has been sold, to regain possession of a thing alienated by repaying the value of it to the possessor. The root of the word redeem actually comes from to buy back, to repurchase. And so to purchase us back from death and hell, Christ suffered and he gave his life. And then he took up his life again. He broke the bonds of death. We're all familiar with this and we celebrate it. Hallelujah. I love how it's expressed by Jacob in 2 Nephi, that they are delivered from that awful monster, death and hell and the devil and the lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. And they are restored to that God who gave them breath, which is the Holy One of Israel. 
Oh, thank you. You are very kind and just in time. Do you have any cookies? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So with that said, let's use an example from the brother of Jared while I check on my time here. Okay. <clears throat> it says, um, and when he had said these words, behold, the Lord showed himself unto him. And he said, because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall. Therefore, ye are brought back into my presence. Therefore, I show myself unto you. You're redeemed, which therefore means you're brought back into my presence. Therefore, I show myself unto you. Here, the Lord defines redemption as being brought back into his presence. And how can we fully be redeemed from the fall of Adam, from death and from hell, until we return to the presence of our Lord from whence we've been shut out? He goes on to say, behold, I am he who was prepared from the foundation of the world for what? To redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. Well, those who become redeemed become his sons and daughters. So therefore, he's the father and the son. He's the son of God, and he becomes the father of the redeemed. Clearly taught here in the Book of Mormon. And then here's something from Joseph from the Lectures on Faith. Let us here observe that after any portion of the human family are made acquainted with the important fact that there is a God who has created and does uphold all things, the extent of their knowledge respecting his character and glory will depend upon their diligence and faithfulness in seeking after him. Until, like Enoch, the brother of Jared and Moses, they shall obtain faith in God and power with him to behold him face to face. That's redemption. So, <clears throat> my thesis tonight, the Book of Mormon is a record by and about those who made the ascent and returned to Christ's presence while yet mortal. It is a lesson manual and a how-to guide for those who wish to similarly ascend and meet our Lord face to face. So, in narrative accounts, in metaphoric journeys, in temple symbolism, the Book of Mormon is unsurpassed and may well be the most important work of ascension literature ever published. Excuse me there. Mm, ice. You don't mind if I chew that in the microphone, do you? <laughs> Yet among believers, this topic is rarely discussed or seriously pursued. And I'm not being critical, but it's a neglected topic. We don't sit in Sunday school class and talk about how do we make the fiery ascent to the presence of Jesus Christ to behold him face to face. That doesn't, at least in my background, that's not normally discussed. But it should be, because it's filled, or the Book of Mormon pages are filled with this notion. In fact, it is so common and so knitted into the story that it's incredible that we miss it. And hopefully by pointing it out, we can pay more attention to it tonight. Now, ascension literature is very common. Um, there are certain ideas that you find in the notion of, a, of an ascent to holiness or to God. First of all, there's a descent that comes first. And the degree to which you descend is the degree to which you can ascend to holiness. The greater the descent, the more you comprehend in the ascent. And Christ descended below it all so that he could get underneath all of it like a lever with a fulcrum and lift the whole thing. No one descended farther than Jesus Christ. Therefore, no one ascended farther than Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you find yourself after this descent in a lone and dreary world like Adam and Eve after they're thrust out of the Garden of Eden. And then there's a process begins that moves from less holiness to greater holiness. Often there is a mystic guide in the classic ascent stories. And there's an ultimate confrontation and a victory for the final ascent. One of my favorite Ascent stories involves a young hero named Luke Skywalker who found himself in a lone and dreary planet, didn't know who he was or what he was doing there, but he was called on this great important mission. He had a mystic guide that found him in the person of Obi-Wan Kenobi <clears throat> and trained him, acquainting him with the ways of the Force until ultimately there was this final confrontation and he blew up the Death Star. And we love that story because that is the story of humans. It's in your DNA. 
That's the story of Jesus Christ. That's the story of everyone here. That's the story of Harry Potter. That's the story of Frodo Baggins. And it's always told the same way. Change the names and it's the same story. Who's the mystic guide to Harry Potter? Albus Dumbledore. Who's the mystic guide to Frodo Baggins? Gandalf and so on. It's always the same story, and we love to watch the movies and buy the books and respond to it because we love ascension. We are here to ascend. That's what you're looking for. Whether you know it or not, your soul is crying for ascent. Well, <clears throat> that's why the idea of ascension is present in nearly all world religions, whether you're looking at Jewish Kabbalah, the ascent to the Holy Mountain in Native American traditions, Christianity, Muhammad's ascent through the seven levels of heaven, uh, Buddhism and the search for nirvana, uh, the Egyptian funerary texts and crossing the great deep to the other side where God is waiting on the horizon, ancient mythology, you go back to the Greeks, it doesn't matter. The ascent story is the human story. Of course, the Book of Mormon's full with it. Now, the doctrine of Christ teaches us about the ascent, starting with the fall of Adam, which is our descent, And then the process of returning to God's presence, beginning with faith, repentance, baptism, which begins the ascent. That's the depth of the descent, down into the water, the old person dying and being buried, coming out to a newness of life following Jesus Christ. The purpose of baptism is so you can receive the Holy Ghost, according to the Book of Mormon, and then ultimately to receive something called the baptism of fire. And then we're taught in 2 Nephi, for behold, again, I say unto you that if you will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what you should do. Behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and there will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. And when he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh, the things which he shall say to you shall ye observe to do. The purpose of the doctrine of Christ is to put you in touch with the Holy Ghost, which will show you all things that you should do on the ascent. Who is the mystic guide? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is your mystic guide to bring you to Christ. And it says it right here in the Book of Mormon. That's literal. Manifesting himself unto you in the flesh is referring to what this ascent is supposed to do. Well, Paul said, excuse me, regarding his ascent, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Whether this ascent happens while you are tabernacled or whether you leave your body is not particularly relevant. If you enter the presence of the divine, that's what matters. Joseph Smith, when I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back looking up into heaven. Didn't know how he got there. We'll talk more about that. Though this ascent happens in mortality, it may or may not happen in the body, and all divine contact represents an ascent from our fallen state. Even if we don't physically go anywhere, it can be a vision. We have biblical examples, of course, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, and so on. We have apocryphal sources. There's an apocryphal text called the Ascension of Isaiah, the Apocalypse of Paul. So this is throughout Biblical literature, of course, and it's all through the Book of Mormon. Now, the idea of ascent often involves a corridor. What I have here is a list of names of this corridor that you'll find in Scripture. A fiery corridor, a pillar of fire, a ladder to heaven, a conduit into heaven, and so on. All of these are referring to a corridor. Whoops, that was the wrong direction that is a connection between the realms, between our fallen world and a realm of holiness. Because when you have to make a connection through the veil, there is a corridor required. There is some kind of a connection. Joseph Smith described the angel that came to his bedroom. And when it was done, he said, a conduit seemed to open right up into heaven and the light gathered and up he went, right through the veil, right up the corridor, back to the realms of holiness. Part of the reason for in a corridor then is so that beings can either ascend or descend. Also, information is shared. You can see things through this corridor. Sight and sound are shared. And this is all well documented in the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> so let's go to some examples in the Book of Mormon of personal ascension. We'll start with Lehi. 
<clears throat> now, this is a special story to me. This represents when my eyes started to open to the incredible power of the Book of Mormon. We are in the first chapter, no matter what version you're in. In the LDS version, you're, you're eight verses in. In other versions, it's going to be similar. <clears throat> but you're in chapter one of 1 Nephi. It came to pass regarding Lehi that as he prayed unto the Lord, there came a pillar of fire and dwelt upon a rock before him. And he saw and heard much. What, he saw fire? That's not much. What was that pillar? Why was there a rock in front of Lehi? What was he doing? When I realized that Lehi was making intercession for his people, praying to God with all of his heart on behalf of his people at an altar, that in response to that prayer, the Lord opened the fiery corridor, opened the conduit, and Lehi had a connection with heaven. He saw and heard much. Joseph Smith said, if you could gaze into heaven five minutes, you would know more than if you had read everything that was ever written on the subject. Lehi gazed into heaven. Later, he goes home, and being thus overcome with the Spirit, he was carried away in a vision, even that he saw the heavens open again, and thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. We call this a throne room theophany. This is chapter one of the book, people. This is the theme. This is where it starts. This is what the book is about. <clears throat> and... Lehi's response later in his life, explaining to his children before he dies, but behold, the Lord hath what? Redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory, and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. Well, there's a lesson. Nephi, <clears throat> this is an important passage. I hate a text wall, but this is an important text wall, so we're going to read this. And it came to pass that after I, Nephi, having heard all the words of my father concerning the things which he saw in vision, and also the things which he spake by the power of the Holy Ghost, which power he received by faith on the Son of God, and the Son of God was the Messiah who should come, I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of these things by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek him. Of course, it's the gift to be our guide, right? As well in times of old as in the time that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. For he is the same yesterday and today and forever. And the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world. If it so be that they repent and come unto him, for he that diligently seeketh shall find. And the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost as well in this time as in times of old, and as well in times of old as in times to come. Wherefore, the course of the Lord is one eternal round. Let me translate this wall of text for you. It's available to everyone, because God is no respecter of persons. And if Nephi could desire to see the things that Lehi saw and go to God and get them, so can you. Because God is no respecter of persons, and Nephi said, the way is prepared for all men. It's not just for church leaders. It's not just for priesthood holders. It is prepared for everyone. Well, <clears throat> here's the steps that Nephi took because I said this was a how-to guide. He says that he desired to know the things. He believed that the Lord was able to make them known. He sat pondering. Undoubtedly, there was much prayer that went into that. And then he found, him safe, found himself carried away, caught away in the spirit of the Lord into an exceedingly high mountain. This was an ascent for Nephi. He, he's asked by the Lord, who is the, appears to him in spirit, what he wants to see. He says, I desire to see the things which my father saw. <clears throat> and he's quizzed about whether he'll believe and so on. And then the verdict is, Blessed art thou, Nephi, because thou believest in the Son of the Most High God, wherefore thou shalt behold the things which thou hast desired. 
And he did. He saw everything Lehi saw, and he shared it in much greater detail. Well, moving on later in life, Nephi said in reference to Isaiah, for he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. And my brother Jacob also hath seen him as I have seen him. And if Nephi can do it, and if Jacob can do it, and if Lehi can do it, so can you. I glory in plainness, I glory in truth. I glory in my Jesus, for he will redeem someday my, no. He hath redeemed my soul from hell because Nephi's been redeemed. He's brought back into the presence of the Lord. What about Jacob? Well, we already know Jacob, his brother. Wherefore, as I said unto you, it must needs be expedient that Christ, for last night the angel spake unto me, this should be his name. Well, there's an ascension right there. He's entertaining angels. Last night, I presume in his bedroom. Heard that before. Behold, I say unto you that none of the prophets have written nor prophesied, say they have spoken concerning this Christ. And this is not all. It has been made manifest unto me, for I have heard and seen, says Jacob. He's not borrowing someone's testimony. He's talking about the God whom he's met. And again, Nephi, my brother Jacob has seen him as I have seen him. Alma the younger, and these are all stories you're familiar with. Alma in his epiphany when he's senseless for three days and he's harrowed up by this horrible agonizing suffering for his sins, I cried within my heart, O Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on me who art in the gall of bitterness and art encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. And now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. Yea, I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more and oh, what joy and what marvelous light I did behold. Yea, and methought I saw, even as our father Lehi saw, God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Yea, and my soul did long to be there. Does your soul long to be there, singing and praising God in the throne room? Alma went, Lehi went. Is there any reason you can't? It's only your choice. King Lamoni, blessed be the name of God and blessed art thou for as sure as thou livest, behold, I have seen my redeemer. Lehi and Nephi, the sons of Helaman. This is a fun one. They're in the prison. The people come to kill them, but they can't because they're encircled about by what? Fire. Why are they encircled about by fire? Because God does magic tricks. We should, that's, that should be setting off alarm bells in our head. A circle of fire means something. And the fire doesn't burn them. And so they take courage. And somebody through the cloud is looking at them going, what's going on? And they're looking up and their faces are shining exceedingly like the faces of angels. And he beheld that they did lift up their eyes to heaven. And they were in the attitude as if talking or lifting their voices to some being whom they beheld. What are they talking to the ceiling? The fiery conduit, they're, they're looking up into heaven. They're conversing with the angels. Anyway, the people repent. The voice comes, declares peace. <clears throat> and then they, see the, they all see the heavens open and angels come down out of heaven and minister. These were the murderers that went to the prison to kill them. In case you were keeping score at home. These people were a lot worse than you. What will it take before the Book of Mormon convinces us to have faith, to seek the face of Jesus Christ, to make the fiery ascent? And I, when I come across shouting, I only do so because I'm so passionate about this, not because I'm angry. So I apologize if my demeanor gets a little serious about this. At Bountiful, when Christ worked the miracle with the children, When he said that their faith was too weak, he couldn't even teach them, but they begged him to stay and he healed all their sick. And then he took the children who were pure, who were not tainted and stained. And he used them in a prayer circle to open the fiery corridor. And then they saw the heavens open. They saw angels descending out of heaven in the midst of fire. They came and encircled those little ones and they encircled about with fire The angels did minister unto them, and the multitude did see and hear and bear record, and they know their record is true, for they all of them 
did see and hear, every man for themselves, 20 or 2,500 people. This is available to us. The Book of Mormon, how many testimonies of the Book of Mormon do we have to have? It's the same testimony, isn't it? It's starting to sound pretty familiar over and over and over. Mormon and Moroni. Mormon, I being 15 years of age, somewhat of a sober mind, <clears throat> I was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus, 15 years old. Hmm. Sounds like someone else I've heard of. Mormon says, He that is found guiltless before him at the judgment day hath it given unto him to dwell in the presence of God in his kingdom, to sing ceaseless praises with the choirs above unto the Father. That's the throne room theophany we've heard about from Lehi and Alma. <clears throat> what about, And then shall ye know that I have seen Jesus, and that he hath talked with me face to face, that he hath told me in plain humility, even as a man telleth another in mine own language concerning these things. This isn't reserved for people that are prophets in the Book of Mormon. The reason these people's records came down to us is because they were regular people like you and like me who decided to repent and seek the Lord, and they succeeded and they wrote it down. These are just journal entries. That can be your journal entry. Well, let's talk about journeys now. While I check my time. <clears throat> oh, that's counting down, not up. All right, I got to get moving. <laughs> there are symbolic journeys starting with a place of contact with God, but limitation. There's a journey required. You got to cross great waters, generally build a ship. There's some elements like a leader, an assistant, crossing the great deep, divine direction, miraculous guidance, tests of faithfulness, and so on. These happen with the Jaredites. These happen with Lehi's people. Even in Lehi's dream, these elements exist. These are all symbolic of the ascent. <clears throat> There's essential ascension symbolism in the temple. Now, the temples, whether they're ancient Hebrew temples or Nephite temples, they're symbolic about the literal presence of God. And sometimes the literal presence of God is there, a pillar of fire by day, or uh, sorry, smoke by day, fire by night, also called the Shekinah. It's the same thing. When the conduits open, the presence of God is there. The Hebrew temple included the outer court for Gentiles, the inner court for women, the holy place for priests, the holy of holies once a year for the high priest, ascending levels of holiness. The Nephite temples were patterned on that, ascending levels of holiness. Look at the community of Christ temple downtown, the ascent in the very architecture of the building. The temple is designed as a tool to teach about ascending into the presence of God. <clears throat> and temples were not synagogues. I'll skip that. In the Book of Mormon, it's clear they're different. Basically, it's everywhere. <clears throat> Here's quoting Zenos, talking about, Thou art merciful, O God. Thou hast heard my prayer when I was in the wilderness. That's with the unclean beasts. When I was in the field, that's with the clean beasts. And when I did turn to my house, that's the holy place. And when I did turn in my closet, in my holy of holies, ascending levels of holiness, it's all through there. The Ramiumptum was even a substitute for that. You know, the high lifted up stand where only one person gets to stand and, oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> so what's the point of all this? <clears throat> The point of all this, and this is the point I'm going to close with, to understand why ascension matters, we have to go back outside the city of Jerusalem to a man named Lehi praying at an altar, making intercession because of the destruction that's coming. And because of the intercession he made, the fiery corridor opened and he had contact with the divine. And what he saw and heard the text says, caused him to quake and tremble exceedingly. Now, he didn't see the destruction of Jerusalem. That was in the next vision. All the horrible stuff was in the next vision, and that made him rejoice. Go read it. It's the weirdest thing ever. What made him quake and tremble exceedingly, I believe, was that he went to intercede, and God took him up on the offer. Lehi, you want to intercede? Let me show you what we need to do. The Deuteronomists are destroying the scriptures and removing all concept of a Messiah. We've already lost the prophet Zenos. We're losing Nahum. We're losing all of the prophets. But there's a record written on metal. Can't be altered. There's only one left, and it's locked in the temple treasury in Jerusalem. You and your sons are going to steal it and take it to another continent. It's an Ark of the Covenant. 
you're going to preserve the covenants of the fathers. Because in the latter days, they're going to go to the Gentiles. And some of them will believe. And they're sitting in this room. And those believing Gentiles will take those covenants back to the scattered remnants, the ruined destruction of the house of Israel. And those people will awake and arise. And God will keep his promises to the fathers. And Israel will be saved. And the world will be saved and Zion will be built and the Lord will come again. And Lehi, it all depends on you. If you don't do this, the covenants will be lost. But thank God he did it. Do we realize what we owe to the fact that Lehi prayed with enough faith to make the ascent? It matters, brothers and sisters, if you make the ascent if you exercise that kind of faith. Nephi said that it is open unto all. I've got 25 seconds. I'm doing good. The way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world. The take-home points that I want you to remember are these. It's James 1.5 that's on trial. It's not Joseph Smith. It's not the Book of Mormon. It's this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. If you believe that, do it. It worked for 14-year-old Joseph Smith. It will work for you. How do you know if you're on the path of ascension? Well, you start with the doctrine of Christ. Faith, repentance, authorized baptism, which is designed to and always will result in receiving the Holy Ghost if it's followed properly. The baptism of fire, if you have not had that, seek it. It's an event. It's unmistakable. You know it. If you're not sure, ask God. Have I had the baptism of fire? No. If not, why not? Find out. It's not automatic with baptism. I was baptized at age eight. I was 25 years old, married, had a kid, returned missionary in the LDS church before I received the baptism of fire. Seek it. Finally, Joseph Smith stated that this book, the Book of Mormon, is the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. Nearer to God doesn't just mean that you'll know about Jesus. You'll feel an affinity toward Jesus. You'll love Jesus. These are important things. Do them. But nearer to God means physically. Nearer to God means being redeemed, coming back into his presence. Do you have faith to believe it, brothers and sisters? Do you have faith to try? Even if you can no more than desire to believe, let this, fit, let this desire work in you until you have faith to plant the seed. When it comes to personal salvation, that's what the book is all about. Joseph was not speaking in metaphors. He meant to bring it. He meant it. He meant for it to be literal, to see, touch, and converse with the Savior face to face as one man speaks with another. God bless you all. Thank you.